There is no doubt about it. We are living in uncommon times. You know, Paul wrote uh, to Timothy, the pastor of the church. Uh, he was a young pastor, and he wrote just giving him a lot of advice. And one of the things that he said that would happen in the last days, and really, it maybe wasn't even so much for Timothy as much as it is for us today. I want you to hear what he said, the culture and the environment. These that he was talking about was uncommon times. Watch this. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, You can be certain, you can be certain of this, that in the last days there'll be, there will be some very hard and difficult times. People will love only themselves and also money. Love themselves, love money. They will be proud, rude, disobedient, and disrespectful to parents. They'll be ungrateful, godless, heartless, hateful. Listen to this part. Their words will be cruel, and they will have no self-control, and they will have no pity for other people. These, it says, these people will hate everything that is good. Boy, it really describes our culture, especially when you go over to Romans chapter 1 and you read about uh, people trading in what is supposed to be God's way, and they traded in for the ungodly. It says... These people will hate everything that's good. They will be sneaky. They'll be reckless. They'll be puffed up with pride. And instead of loving God, they'll love pleasure above God. Even though they make a show of being religious, there is no religion in them. And their true religion is not true at all. It doesn't work. I was thinking about that because I was thinking about what we're watching in our country today. Man, we are seeing a political divide. We're seeing people against one another, racism and uh, implications of racism, and there's all kinds of attacks that are going on in cities. Think about the, the things that are happening in the cities in Minneapolis, in, in the state of Washington, in Seattle, in Chicago, in New York, and a lot of the, the, the cities that have the socialistic governments there. And it's not about just pointing fingers and saying who's right or who's wrong. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about having uncommon loyalty. Three words that I feel like the Lord gave me to share with you today that will be a key. It's a biblical key to restore, to restore to us toxic relationships and bring them back to health. Now, it can't always be done, but the scripture says, as far as you are concerned, the book of Romans says, it also says it in a couple other places, as far as you're concerned, be able to try to live at peace with people who you can. Sometimes it's a wife. Sometimes it's a husband. Sometimes it's a family member that's become toxic. Maybe because of an, an, an addiction to drugs or to alcohol. And then all of a sudden they have, it's not all of a sudden, but they become very toxic. And you find that there's no unity, no, no love going on. A lot of strife and a lot of problems as a result of that. Do you, do you know that a city can become a whole city can become toxic because of that? The whole culture, a relationship can become toxic. I was thinking about the scripture in the book of Exodus where the children of Israel, man, they had experienced God's presence. They've been delivered. They've been brought out of Egypt, miracle after miracle. But they were starting to get, to get thirsty. And watch what happens in Exodus chapter 15, verse 23. It says, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against their leadership. The people grumbled against Moses. Isn't it amazing how when there's a problem, Moses didn't cause the water to become bitter, but yet he's the fault, right? That's what they say. I mean, they start blaming him and they start pointing fingers at him. They start grumbling against him. It says, so Moses cried out to the Lord. Listen, if you're under attack and people are accusing you and grumbling against you, the best thing you and I can do in that time and in that environment is to call out to the Lord. Lord, I need some wisdom here. Lord, I need some help. Now watch what happens. He cries out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. See that tree over there? The Lord is getting ready to preach something right here. He says, look over there, there's a tree. And he threw the tree into the water, and a miracle happened. 
Well, some of you are pretty sharp, and I, get, I, I bet you guess what's going to happen. I'm talking about the tree of the cross. The Bible says if a man dies on the tree that he is cursed. Well, Jesus died on a tree for your sins and for mine. He died that the bitter things of our life might become sweet things of our life. You know, God has this way of taking the bitterness of scars and hurt and pain and turning that around for us. Now, the Lord, I told you, the Lord gave me three words to share with you. The first word is honor. If you want to turn your life around, the one thing that you can do to start that is to begin to honor. I want to say this to you. Honor is the first step to take in changing everything. And boy, in this culture we live in, we don't see a whole lot of honor. We see people being disrespectful. The scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Husbands, live with your lives in an understanding way, showing honor to her. She is the woman that God gave you. And since she is an heir with you, meaning she has, you could call her the queen, or you could call her the heir to the royal uh, priesthood or to the royal kingship of our Lord and Savior. Since she is an heir, she's an equal with you, it says, you with the grace of life pray that your prayers won't be hindered by dishonor and disrespect. So I want to say it this way. If you want to block your prayers from being answered, once in a while people will say, it just seems like I never hear God's voice. It seems like just God doesn't speak to me and he for sure isn't answering my prayer. My first thing that I always go to in my mind is, how is this person doing with honor? I could go on and teach on this for a lot of different aspects, from a lot of different aspects that we are to honor uh, our president, we are to honor our leadership, we are to honor our spouses, we are to honor our pastors, we are to honor what God has set in authority. And in this culture we have where it's a kind of a narcissistic, disrespectful, dishonor, maybe we don't agree, not maybe, we don't agree on everything. We don't agree on it. Husbands and wives, I know you don't agree on everything, but watch this. When you show honor, that's my wife, that is my husband, that is my president. I see Christian people putting on Facebook all the time. This is why I have a little bit of a hard time with Facebook because I hate all the negativity and the strife that Facebook has. But I see people, Christian people, putting on there, that's not my president. They said it with President Bill Clinton. Many people said it with uh, President Obama. People are saying it with President Trump, that's not my president, just because you don't like maybe their personality or you don't like their policy. Let me share this with you. Nero was the emperor, probably the most wicked ruler to ever rule. One of the most, at least in the top five, probably the most wicked. And it's amazing because Peter tells us and also Paul tells us in the time of Nero, when Nero was the one that had both of them, they both were martyred. Peter was martyred, on a, on a, not on a cross, but on an X. They stretched his body out on wooden beams like an X, and they stretched him out, and they crucified him on that. Now, Paul was a Roman citizen, so they had mercy on him, and they just chopped his head off because that was quick, real quick. But both of them were martyred by Nero, who they both said, show honor to the emperor. Why did they say that? The emperor was so evil. Here's what I want to say to you. If you want to cut off God's blessing and you want to take yourself out of the blessed place, show disrespect and honor to your president to your husband, to your wife, to your local authorities. Listen, you might not like their policies, but you and I as believers, we have a duty to show honor to those in authority and those that we have commitment to. And I just want to share this. You might not like the message, 
but it is the word of God that will open up the blessing and it will turn the bitter areas of your life. This is not a political message. This is a message about getting you to the sweet spot of God's blessing, turning those bitter waters in your life and in mine, turning them to good. Honor is kind of like looking past the person to the position and honoring. And then when you do that, God has the way. Here's what I like to always say. God knows how to fix. I've heard people say, I just, I don't know if I can trust my pastor because I've seen pastors do crazy things before. Well, let me tell you something. You can trust God with your pastor. How, do you, how can you do that? Because God knows how to get them right and knows how to take them out of the place. That's not your responsibility. That's not my responsibility with government, with pastors, with teachers, with administrators, even with husbands, even with wives. It's God's responsibility. Our responsibility individually is to show honor. Pastor Ryan did a fabulous message in this series called Uncommon Honor. The reason it was called Uncommon Honor is because honor really isn't common in this society today. But for you and I, it's going to be commonplace in our life. We are going to, in Jesus' name, show honor. We're talking about taking those bitter waters. It's bitter if you watch the news media. You watch any of those news stations. Man, the attacks against each other is crazy bitter right now. But we want to turn that sweet. Now, how do we do that? We take the love of Jesus and that cross and we place it in that place. I had a friend of mine who was telling me a story of when he was on vacation. He was in Florida. And you know how in Florida the storms will come up on those beaches. I mean, it'll turn just, it'll be sunshine. And a couple hours later, all of a sudden, you're having a rain, a downpour of rain and lightning all around. And there was this flagpole in the condominium complex that he was staying in. And this guy walks out in the middle of the storm while it's raining, while it is lightning, and the lightning is flashing all around. And he walks out below that flagpole and he puts, we just celebrated Independence Day this weekend, puts his hand over his heart and he salutes the flag. And then he, in the middle of lightning, begins to take that flag down. Why? Out of honor, I'm sure. And he folded that flag up nicely, put it underneath his arm, protecting that flag, walking in. And the story was being told, and someone said, why would he do that? That is so dangerous to do that right in the middle of the storm. And I thought to myself, I bet you I know exactly why he did that. I bet you that is a veteran who went to war for our country, who went out and probably lost friends because he looks past just the fabric. He looks past the stars, the red, the white, and the blue on the flag. He looks past that to the meaning and the purpose of what it means that this country is a country of freedom, that this country is an independent country from the tyranny of fascism, socialism, communism, which all three of those, you just need to know this biblically, those three things are anti-Christ. They're against God's ways. Not just are they an opposing view. Uh, no, they're against the anointing. They're against it. And so that man went out, put his hand over his heart, saluted the flag, took it down and took it in. I thought, what if we had that for one another? What if we look past the outer skin or the outer shell of a person's opinions or their personality, and we look to the soul of the person, and we said, that is my police chief. That is my governor. That is my president. Now, they are, and we honor the position. It doesn't mean you fall in love with it, but it goes on and says in First Peter, honor all men. Honor all men. Not pick and choose, but honor all men. Now, here's the second word that the Lord gave me. The second word is trust, because trust is something that is built. You cannot demand another person's trust. Trust me. You can show honor to everybody, whether they're trustworthy or not. But what you and I can do is we can personally build trust in those around us. We can honor those around us and then build trust in people. 
I like what Stephen Covey said. I've heard this before, and I'm sure you might have heard it before too. It says, we judge ourselves by our intentions. Like, you know, we give ourselves, well, you know what I meant. You know what I intended to do. I intended, I know you misunderstood, but you intended. We judge ourselves by intention, but he goes on and says, we judge other people by their behavior. That's a double standard. Don't have a double standard with that. Trust is very important. Now, you can be gullible with trust. I have a, I have a tendency to do that. I, I like to believe the best in everybody. True story with me. One time, I went to look at a motorcycle. I just trust people. And these guys were having a party. I went to look at the motorcycle. And uh, five of them came out to talk to me. I was, And it was a real friendly conversation. And he said, yeah, come and see the motorcycle. It was a used motorcycle, a dirt bike. I was about 18 years old. I was going to buy the dirt bike. Had the money in my pocket to buy it. And they said, yeah, it's over here. We went around the side of the house to look at it. Well, when we got around the side of the house, it wasn't five guys anymore. It was about 20 guys. And the next thing I know, I was on the ground and I was being pummeled. Yeah, I was 18 years old. I'm gullible. I just believe, I, I try to believe the best in, in people. Now, you shouldn't be as gullible as I was. You should be, you know, trusting people, but also do what President Reagan said to Gorbachev back in Russia. Trust, but verify. In other words, you can trust people, but keep your eyes open also. It's kind of in the middle there. And that's important. Trust is important, that we're able to trust people and, until they show you that they can't be trusted, Right. And then the third word, this is my favorite word. This one is one that is near and dear to my heart, being a pastor, is loyalty. I love you guys when you're loyal, when you show loyalty, when you, how do you show loyalty? When there's problems and you're still loyal. I love loyalty in a marriage when the easy thing to do could be quit. I love loyalty when the easy thing could be to quit the job, but Someone works through the process and, and they're loyal to you. Uh, when a congregation, you know, there might be things you don't like about your church. By the way, there's no perfect church. You know, you might say, well, that church does this better. I bet they do. There's a lot of churches better at certain things. But where God places you, that's where you should plant your roots and become loyal to the vision of the house. And if there's some things you don't like about it, maybe you should be the one to step up and make those things happen, right? Uh, if you want more fellowship, be the one to throw the party. Come on, we're not against parties. We're not against fellowship. But it's funny how people will point fingers and say, well, I don't like this and I don't like that. Maybe at a job, maybe at a business, maybe in our country. How about if we become the agents of change through the loyal commitment in your marriage. Well, I don't like the way you don't take the trash out. I don't like the way you do this in the marriage or that in the marriage. How about becoming loyal to the marriage and loving through that process, through honor, through trust, and through loyalty? Now, think about this. The next verse says in Exodus, let me go back to the story, where Moses took the children of Israel and it was a bitter place and the Lord showed him the tree over there, and he threw the tree in the water, and the water, a miracle happened. This is what happens in your life and mine when we take the tree of the cross as the foundation for our love, for our loyalty, for our trust, for our commitment and honor towards one another. The miracle happens, and it happens when you do this and when I do it. Throw that tree into the middle of your marriage. Throw it into the middle of a political situation, your viewpoint. In other words, be mature enough to yield your personal view. I was raised a, a Democrat all my life. I will be a Democrat. Well, maybe I won't be. I was raised a Republican all of my life. Well, maybe I won't be. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a god honoring, God-following person in this crazy, mixed-up culture and world. I'm going to stay committed to my marriage. I'm going to be loyal to my church. I'm going to be loyal to my president, to my governor, to my nation. I might not agree. In fact, don't agree with a lot of the stuff, but I'm going to commit to beyond the colors, beyond the fabric, 
to the heart and the soul. It'll bring unity. We are all one nation under God, and if we're under God, and if we are committed to one another, there is no race, mm -mm, no room for racism, no room for division, no room for a bunch of different visions. We come under the vision of the house, under the vision of the unity that God has called us to. How does he do it? In verse 30, I mean, in chapter 34 of Exodus, verse 6, listen to what the scripture says. The Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. Don't you love it that he gives us his name? By the way, right after here is where in the Hebrew, he reveals one of his names. Not I do this, but this is actually who I am. He says, I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord that heals you, he told Moses. Do you need healing in any area of your life? Maybe healing in your marriage, healing in your finances, healing in your body, healing in uh, with your children. Come on. We all need it in some area. He is the Lord that heals you. When you throw that tree, that's why part of covenant's not just saving you from the fire and the punishment of hell, but he saves you for something. And that is that he saves you to have the sweet life. I came that you might have and enjoy life in abundance to the full till it overflows. Mm. May we all have that kind of a life. He goes on and says, the Lord is slow to anger. I like this part. He is abounding in loyal love. Think about that. He's abounding in loyal love. And then he says it again, faithfulness and keeping loyal love for thousands, forgiving them, forgiving their iniquities and their transgressions of sin. Mm. The Lord wants to forgive you. He wants to forgive me. He wants to forgive us. It's time to come back home. It's time to let those bitter things go. No more forgiveness. No more will I stay offended. I refuse to be offended. Do this. Your hand. I always... Tell people to do this. Offense, what are you doing? You're flinging it behind you. You're not going to hang on to that offense. Um, Hebrews, I love this. This is how loyal the Lord is to you. It says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, the Lord himself will not in any way fail you, in no way, nor will he give you up and leave you without support. How many of you need, you're like me, you need support from Jesus. I do too. And he is not going to fail you. It says he will not leave you without support. I will not. I like it. He says it three times. I will not. I will not. I will not leave you in no way, shape, or form. I will not leave you. Not in any degree leaving you helpless or forsaking you. I will not relax my hand or my grip on you. Assuredly not. Amen. So loyalty is about compassion. Loyalty is not only about compassion, but it is about grace, about patience. Loyalty is about faithfulness, commitment. I will remain faithful when it doesn't feel good, when it's not convenient, when things have gone and I don't even see a way out. I'm going to remain faithful. In fact, I'll be the change to this, to this need that I see. I'll be the one to bring it. See, we're not consumers. We don't attend church for consumers. I know a lot of people start church like, well, let me see. Their coffee tastes good. They have good fellowship over here. They have good this. The preaching is horrible here. But, but you know, the, 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 the nursery's good. The coffee tastes good. And the music's good. I think I'll go there. Listen, you need to be where God wants you to be. And the biggest and the most important thing for a church is not the praise and worship. I love great praise and worship. It's not the fellowship. I love great fellowship, and let's have it. But the most important thing is, are you hearing the voice of the great shepherd through your shepherd? That's how you pick a church. That's how you commit to a church. And then all those other things, you help those things happen as part of it. But the most important thing in your life is that you're able to hear the voice of your shepherd through your shepherd, through your pastor. That's important. You commit to that. Um, what do you do if someone does abuse you? 
What do you do when someone makes a mistake? Luke chapter 17 says this in verse 3. If your brother sins, you, you rebuke him. In other words, you go to him and love privately. And then if he repents, forgive him. And, and if he sins against you seven times, forgive him seven times. And you must forgive him, the scripture says. Now, a lot of people say, well, if he says he's sorry. No, what I'm saying is you restore if they turn. Not saying I'm sorry. This didn't say anything about saying I'm sorry. This is about a turning. If there's a turning, then you restore the relationship. People ask me this all the time. I've lived this myself. What do you do with a toxic person who is, who, say for an example, an example, in a marriage, there is adultery, ongoing adultery in the marriage, or there's abandonment where they leave you and you're left alone. You don't know if they're coming back or not. They're gone. And then the third one is abuse. Maybe it's physical abuse, abuse, sexual abuse. Uh, maybe it's verbal abuse. I don't know if you've ever had anybody in your life that tells you they hate you, anybody that tells you they wish you were in hell, burn in hell, that they want to slit your throat and dance in your blood. <laughs> I don't know if you've had that. I have. I've had that. And I want you to know something. There are times where the Lord says, okay, for your health and for your protection, you love them. You must always love them. You must always show them honor. But you don't have to be in fellowship with that. You can distance yourself. You can start fresh. Love them at a distance. Totally biblical. Totally okay. See, some people will say, no, you got to go back in. Go back into that abuse and let them just abuse you. Hey, I want to bring some peace to you. No, you don't. You can love them from a distance. You can forgive them from where you're at. But you do not have to be beat up verbally or physically or sexually. If they've abandoned you and they've left you, it is what it is, and you forgive them. You may have to just let that go when you think about it every time. But you let it go. And you forgive them. And then if, they're, if they have a position of honor, you must honor the position. But it doesn't mean that you have to be in unity and fellowship with them. I think that's what Jesus was saying here in Luke 17. If they repent means that they've changed. Now we can be back in that relationship again. But if every time I talk to you, you tell me how bad I am and how much I hate you and you know, that you, you want to see me burn in hell, but, well, that, you don't have to listen to that. You love them. You do forgive them. And you do honor them. I'm smiling at you because I know that's hard for you to do. But you can do it. You can. And, uh, and so we make that commitment. Here's what I want to do. I really am praying for this nation. I can't make people love one another. I can't make people show honor to one another. I can't make people be loyal. But what I can do is throw the tree in the bitter situation. When I hear a news story, when I get a phone call, when someone is disloyal, someone leaves me that I thought would always be with me. Uh, as a pastor, that happens <laughs> more often than I want it to happen. Uh, it's just part of what happens to pastors. And a lot of times pastors will become calloused and closed off because it is painful when someone that you love and you thought would always be with you bolts and beats, beats feet down the road. It's painful. It's hard. But here's what I want to do. I want to turn those bitter moments to sweet moments by taking the tree of honor. Mm -hmm. I want to take that tree of honor. And I want to take that tree of trust, giving trust because it's the right thing to do. And I want to take that tree, my favorite tree, is the tree of loyalty. It means so much to me when people are loyal for the long term. And I love that. Take those trees, just like Jesus died in the middle of three of two other guys. There were three trees there. And Jesus took bad situations and he turned them around with the tree of his love, his compassion, and his mercy. If you ask for forgiveness, Lord, forgive us 
for becoming bitter at our, you know, the enemies that have different viewpoints than us, different political views, different spiritual views or values than us. Lord, we forgive them. And we take the cross of your love, your loyalty, your trust, and your honor, and we throw it in the bitter waters of our life. And we will believe you that a miracle is going to happen and turn around in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.